Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the RAS proteins. Okay, so, uh, we've just discussed uh, the four different RAS proteins which are produced uh, by the three different uh, RAS genes that we have. Okay, now what we want to discuss is the first thing which is going to happen to these RAS proteins after they've been produced, which is that they're going to be uh, farnesylated, okay? So, I want to show you what this means, i.e. what is a farnesyl group, okay? And to do that, I need to explain to you the structure of a molecule uh, called isoprene, okay? Because farnesyl is a prenyl group. Okay, so let me just write this down. So, farnesyl, which is the group that we are going to add onto uh, our uh, RAS protein first. And again, it is a lipid modification of uh, proteins. So, there are three major types of uh, ways that you can modify proteins by sticking lipids onto them. One is prenylation, which means sticking farnesyl groups or geranyl geranyl groups. But in this case, it's going to be farnesyl onto uh, proteins. The next is uh, sticking acyl groups onto uh, proteins, uh, such as palmitoyl groups or myristoyl groups. And then finally, there's also putting glycosyl, phosphatidyl, and inositol groups onto proteins. Okay, right, so the first lipid modification that both, well, that all four of these uh, RAS proteins are going to undergo is that they're going to have farnesyl groups put on, and farnesyl groups are an example of a prenyl group, okay, because uh, they are based on the molecule isoprene. So let me show you the structure of the molecule isoprene, so I'll draw its skeletal structure out for you. So. This is the skeletal structure of farnesyl. So one, two, three, four carbons, and you'll have a double bond there as well. And then you have a methyl group coming off this uh, carbon here, okay? Right, so um, we're drawing a skeletal structure, so we don't show carbon atoms, we implicitly show them as corners, okay? So we've shown all of our five carbons, and we don't show hydrogens coming off the carbons, and that means that we don't actually need to show anything else, basically. Off this carbon, you will then have two hydrogens coming off it, but we don't show those. Off this carbon, you'll have a single hydrogen coming off it, but we don't need to show that. Off this carbon, you don't have any hydrogens coming off it, because we have four bonds to other carbon atoms. And finally, off this carbon up here, you have three hydrogen atoms coming off it, but you don't need to show any of them. And, oh, whoops, that wasn't the final carbon. Down here, there's another carbon, and off this, you would have two hydrogens coming off it, but we don't need to show them. Now, basically, you can polymerize isoprene together, and if you join three isoprene molecules together, uh, you can create a farnesyl group. Okay, so let me show you how this polymerization is going to happen. So basically, what you can imagine doing is breaking the second of these two double bonds, uh, well, of the two bonds in the double bond, um, in both of these cases. So both of these double bonds consist of two covalent bonds. Break one of those covalent bonds. Okay, now in each covalent bond there are two electrons, one from each of the two members of the bond. Okay, so imagine sending the electron from this carbon back to this carbon, and the electron from this carbon back to this carbon, and do the same thing when you break this bond here. Send one electron back to this carbon and one back to this carbon. Now, I want to stress that there will still be a single bond between this carbon and this carbon. We've only broken one of the two bonds that exist between them. Now, what we're going to then do is form a bond between this carbon and this carbon to turn this bond here into a double bond. And we can do this because both of these carbons now have free electrons. This carbon got a free electron from the breaking of this bond, and this carbon got a free electron from the breaking of this bond. Okay, so what we will effectively produce is this structure here. Okay, like so, and you'll have a double bond there. But now, both of these carbons on the ends, they have free electrons which they want to bind together. But then you can take another one of these uh, isoprene intermediates, if you like. 
OK, and where can I show this? I would like to put it there, but uh, I haven't really left space. But if you can imagine copying this out and bringing another one here and joining uh, this second isoprene's molecule, uh, carbon on the left, to this first isoprene molecule's carbon on the right, uh, then that's how we're going to polymerize these together. And you can imagine doing this on and on and on, basically. OK, so what we're effectively going to do is take three of these uh, isoprene groups and link them together to create a Farnesyl group. So let me show you this. So I will now draw out three of these isoprene intermediates, if you like. So here's one. And now let me put another one here. There's a double bond. Like There's its methyl group. And there's that second isoprene intermediate drawn out. OK, and then we've got our final one over here. So we've now got three of them. And what we're going to do is form a bond between this carbon and this carbon, because remember, both of them have free electrons. So this carbon's free electron is like this one's up here, and this carbon's free electron is like this one. OK, so we'll join those two together, and again, we'll do the same here. And that now just leaves this carbon with a free electron, and this carbon with a free electron. What you're going to do is you're going to bind this carbon's free electron to a hydrogen atom and put another hydrogen off that so that this carbon will have three uh, hydrogens coming off it. You're then going to attach this carbon to uh, another atom, basically. And this is why it's called a Farnesyl group rather than a Farnesyl molecule. Basically, it's not finished. And the story is not over. It's linked to something else, OK? Uh, so. This is a Farnesyl group, then, that we've created here. OK, so basically what you're now going to do is you're going to stick this Farnesyl group onto uh, your RAS proteins that you've just created. So basically, each RAS protein is going to end up with a single Farnesyl group stuck onto it. And uh, the reason that this happens is because these RAS proteins are all Cax box proteins. Excuse me. And basically, you are going to add this Farnesyl group onto this cysteine atom that is four in from the final amino acid. OK, so to have a Farnesyl group added onto you, you have to have a Cax box at your carboxy terminus. And also, this amino acid that I've put in position X here, and there is no amino acid that's represented by the uh, letter X, OK? Uh, this just means any old amino acid. Now, it can't be any old amino acid. There are certain amino acids uh, that um, need to be in that position if you're actually going to have a Farnesyl group put onto you. OK, so X either needs to be a serine amino acid, a methionine amino acid, or an alanine amino acid. OK, so in order to um, have a Farnesyl group added onto uh, you. If you're a protein, then if you want to have a Farnesyl group added onto you, you need one of these Cax boxes at the end. You need to have a cysteine 4 in from the end, then you need two aliphatic amino acids, and I'll explain, give you some examples of aliphatic amino acids in a moment, and then in the final position, you have to have uh, an amino acid that is either serine, methionine, or alanine. So let me just go over the R groups of serine, methionine, and alanine. OK, so I'll start off by drawing the core amino acid structure. So here is the amino group. Here is the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. Here is the carboxylic acid group. OK, and here is the R group. Now, in the case of serine, the R group, and I'm not going to draw out the core amino acid structure for each one. I'm just going to draw out the R group for each one. In the case of serine, the R group, um, where can I put this? I'm going to have to draw it down here. I can't fit it in all over there. OK, so uh, in the case of serine, the R group is a methylene group with a thiol group. Uh, sorry, not with a thiol group. I'm thinking of cysteine. Uh, with an alcohol group coming off it. OK, right. So that's the R group of serine. Uh, the R group of methionine. Methionine's R group is that you have two methylene groups. OK, so I'll show this. So an ethylene group, if you like. So here is an ethylene group. 
and then you have a sulfuretum and then a methyl group on the other side. Okay, so this is the R group of methionine. And then finally, the amino acid alanine, uh, the R group is just a methyl group. Okay, so you just have a carbon with three hydrogens sticking off uh, as the R group. Okay, so uh, these are the three different amino acids that can be in position X on your CAX box if you're going to have a Farnesyl group added onto uh, the uh, protein. And specifically, the Farnesyl group is going to be added onto the cysteine uh, residue of the CAX box. Okay, now just before I discuss how you're actually going to add that Farnesyl group on, I promise to give you some examples of aliphatic um, amino acids that you can have in position A. Okay, right, so aliphatic amino acids. Basically, aliphatic molecules are non-polar molecules, and they're also non-aromatic, okay? So they're generally quite hydrophobic, um, um, but they're not aromatic is the important distinction. Okay, so they don't have aromatic rings, they don't have delocalized electrons, and they're not polar either. Okay, so some examples. Uh, the amino acid glycine is an example of an of a aliphatic amino acid. Okay, glycine's R group is just a hydrogen. Alanine is another example of a aliphatic um, amino acid. Its R group is just a methyl group. Okay, and continuing on some more interesting ones, and ones which are going to be very important in a moment when I tell you about the tax box structures for each of the uh, KRAS proteins. Uh, valine is going to is another example of an aliphatic amino acid, and valine basically consists of a carbon coming off the uh, alpha carbon, and then with two methyl groups stuck off the side. Okay, so there's the structure of valine. Uh, then we have leucine, Okay, uh, leucine is effectively a bigger valine, okay, so you have a methylene group, and then you have the same structure as valine stuck off this methylene group, so basically it's valine with an extra methylene group stuck in, okay, so off this uh, second carbon you then have two methyl groups, and then finally there's another amino acid that's uh, a common example of an aliphatic amino acid, which is isoleucine. Okay, so isoleucine is a isomer of leucine. So basically what we're going to do is swap around one of these hydrogens on this first carbon for one of these methyl groups on the uh, second carbon. Okay, so the R group of isoleucine will have a methyl group off this first carbon here, and then a hydrogen off it, and then two hydrogens off the second carbon, and then a methyl group off it. Okay, so this is the structure of isoleucine. Now, just to give you the single letter amino acid codes for all of these, now all of these have very simple uh, single letter amino acid codes. Okay, so these are not difficult ones to remember. Glycine single letter code is G, alanine single letter code is A, valine single letter amino acid code is V, leucine single letter amino acid code is L, and isoleucine's single letter amino acid code is I. Okay, right. So now let me show you the tax box structure of the uh, different KRAS uh, proteins. Okay, so let's just recite off the different RAS proteins initially. So we have KRAS 4A was our uh, first example of a RAS protein. Okay, and its tax box is cysteine, uh, 4 in from the terminal amino acid, then two isoleucines. So I is the single letter amino acid code for isoleucine. And then in position four, uh, sorry, well, <laughs> sorry, right at the end, the terminal amino acid is then a methionine, okay? So remember, that final amino acid had to be either methionine, serine, or alanine for it to work. Okay, so this fits the build, basically. We have a cysteine, four in, then we have two beautifully aliphatic amino acids followed by a methionine. So this is a CAX box, okay? Uh, then we'll look at uh, KRAS um, 4B, the other splice variant of the KRAS gene. Okay, now its CAX box is a cysteine 
followed by a valine, followed by an isoleucine, followed by a methionine. Okay, now the other examples, uh, HRAS, okay, its CAX box consists of a cysteine, so you always have a cysteine 4 in from the uh, terminal amino acid, okay. Then we have a valine and a leucine, and then finally, in the final amino acid position, you then have a serine. And finally, if we look at the CAX box of the final uh, RAS protein, which is NRAS, basically its CAX box consists of a cysteine followed by two valines and then a methionine is the final amino acid of the polypeptide. Okay, so all of the uh, RAS proteins have beautiful CAX boxes, so they're all going to get farnesylated uh, on this cysteine. And I should just stress that uh, if you have a CAX box structure where you have cysteine, two aliphatic amino acids, and then you don't have a methionine, a serine, or an alanine there, then it can mean that instead you'll end up getting geronyl geronylated rather than farnesylated. So this final amino acid here determines uh, which uh, prenyl group you're going to get stuck on, whether you're going to get farnesyl or geronyl geronyl stuck on. Okay, so methionine, alanine, and serine are the amino acids that you need in this X position, i.e. the final amino acid of the polypeptide, in order to get farnesylated. Okay, so let's now talk about how uh, you're going to farnesylate the CAX box. Okay, so we need to look at the structure of a cysteine amino acid. And I'm going to show this as a cysteine residue. So I'm going to show its structure as though it's within the protein. So the amino group is bound to the amino acid that's prior to the cysteine. Then you have the alpha carbon here. And then you have the carboxylic acid group, which will then be linked to the amino group of the amino acid after the cysteine. Now, the R group of uh, a cysteine amino acid is a methylene group, then with a thiol group sticking off it like so. Okay, now let's bring in our uh, farnesyl group. Okay, so remember how the structure of the Farnesyl group, so remember it consists of these uh, three isoprene molecules stuck together, so initially I'll just draw three isoprene intermediates and then we will uh, connect them up. Okay, so here is our three Farnesyl intermediates, we'll link this one and this one and then we'll put a hydrogen on here. Okay, now let me just straighten this out. Remember we've got a free electron here what we're going to do is break this bond between the sulfur and the hydrogen of the cysteine residue, specifically this cysteine that is 4 in from the terminal amino acid, okay? So this is the cysteine that is going to be farnesylated. Okay, now what's going to happen is you can imagine giving one electron back to the sulfur atom and one back to the hydrogen. Take that hydrogen off, that you can imagine is the hydrogen that's been put on over here, and then uh, you bind this sulfur atom to that carbon atom, okay, because both of them now have free electrons, so they can form a covalent bond. Okay, now this structure is what's known as a thioether link, okay? So, an ether molecule is when you have basically an oxygen atom between two carbons. If you have a structure like this, this is an ether link between this carbon and this carbon. Okay, now oxygen is a very similar atom to sulfur. They're both in the same group of the periodic table. Sulfur is just below oxygen in the periodic table. So it's got very similar chemical properties. So when you have sulfur linked to two carbons like this, this is called a thioether link. So it's drawing the comparison between uh, the link between oxygen, well, when you've got two carbons linked by an oxygen, and the um, scenario when you've got two carbons linked by a sulfur atom. Okay, right. Uh, so, this is how you farnesylate uh, RAS proteins, basically. Okay, so all of the RAS proteins are going to get farnesyl groups added on to this carbon, or, sorry, this cysteine of the uh, CAX box that is 4 in from the terminal amino acid. Okay, now, once they have got these Farnesyl groups added onto them, so let's show this. 
So if we have our uh, RAS protein that's just been synthesized, and at the moment it's been synthesized in the cytoplasm, and I should have stressed that more, um, the synthesis of RAS occurs on three uh, cytoplasmic ribosomes. So at the moment, the RAS protein is within the cytoplasm. Okay, so let me just draw a picture of the cell here with the various compartments that are going to be important for our uh, discussion. Okay, so here is the uh, nucleus of the cell, and then we'll have an important organelle here. This will represent the endoplasmic reticulum, and I think I'll colour in the different organelles in different colours. So I'll colour in the nucleus in orange here. Okay, I'll colour in uh, the endoplasmic reticulum in turquoise. Let me just label these up before we talk about some more compartments. Okay, so this is the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and I'll also just label up the nucleus so that my diagram looks complete. So this is the nucleus. And another important organelle in our um, discussion is going to be the Golgi apparatus. Okay, so this consists of loads of flattened membrane bound. Um, compartments, if you like, that are all um, put on top of one another, all stacked on top of one another, and each one of these is what's known as a cisternae, okay? So, well, it's, it's a cisterna, but the plural is cisternae. Okay, right, so the whole thing then, uh, which usually consists of around seven cisternae, although I've only drawn four because it didn't all fit in, this is then called the Golgi apparatus. Okay, and I'll colour in the Golgi apparatus, I think, in red. Right, so let me get the red pen. So, this is the Golgi apparatus in red here. Now, at the moment, our RAS protein is floating around quite happily in the cytoplasm here. So this is our RAS protein, and I'll highlight the RAS protein in the colour as well. So this is the RAS protein in green here. Okay. Right, so at the moment it's in the cytoplasm. Now, once you add this farnesyl group onto this cysteine residue that's 4 in from the terminal amino acid and is therefore in the hypervariable region of the RAS um, protein, okay, so I'll draw this farnesyl group here. What's going to happen is the RAS protein is going to attach itself to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. It's going to attach itself to the cytoplasmic uh, aspect of the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so in vivid purple here, this represents the farnesyl group that you have stuck onto uh, this RAS protein. And remember, each RAS protein is going to get one and only one uh, um, farnesyl group added onto it. Okay, and what's going to happen is the Farnesyl group is going to like to be in the phospholipid bilayer of the ER because um, there are lots of hydrophobic uh, long-chain fatty acids within this uh, phospholipid bilayer and it will interact very favourably with them. So what's going to happen is the Farnesyl group is going to go and implant itself into uh, the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and that means that the RAS protein is going to get attached to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and it will be on the cytoplasmic side of this membrane, so the side facing the cytoplasm, uh, rather than the luminal side, which faces the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, what's now going to happen uh, are what are known as post-prenylation modifications. Okay, so the next stage is what's known as post-prenylation modifications. Okay, and this again is going to happen for all of the RAS proteins, which is why I haven't specified specifically which RAS protein we're talking about. Okay, so it's called post-prenylation uh, modifications because it's occurring after you have prenylated the RAS protein. So we've just added the prenyl group onto uh, the RAS protein, uh, which is this farnesyl group, and now it's implanted in the ER membrane, and enzymes that are also implanted in the ER membrane are going to act on this um, farnesylated um, RAS protein. Okay, so the first thing that is going to happen is that you're going to remove 
the final free amino acids of the uh, RAS protein. Okay, so remember, at the carboxyl terminus of the RAS protein, so if I revert back to drawing the RAS protein as a, a polymer of amino acids like so, we know that it, the final four amino acids were cysteine, followed by an aliphatic amino acid, followed by another aliphatic amino acid, followed by an X amino acid, which was either uh, serine, methionine, or alanine. But of course, we know uh, in the case of the RAS proteins, it was either methionine or serine. There was no alanine. But it could have still been alanine and been phonazolated. Okay, what's now going to happen is once you've actually stuck this phanazal group onto that cysteine uh, residue and the N RAS protein is now anchored into uh, the ER membrane, you're going to chop off these final free amino acids here, okay? And this process of chopping off the final free amino acids and making the cysteine residue, the final amino acid of the polypeptide, is what's known as AAX. Uh, proteolysis because you are chopping off the aliphatic, aliphatic, and then X amino acid. Okay, right. So there is an enzyme in uh, the um, phospholipid bilayer of the ER membrane which is going to remove this AAX uh, little tripeptide, if you like, from the polypeptide. Okay, and this enzyme is known as RCE1. Okay, which stands for RAS converting enzyme 1. So R stands for RAS. Okay, the C then stands for converting. Okay, the E is then for enzyme and then just 1. So this is the RAS converting enzyme 1. So basically, if this is the membrane of the ER, you have this protein which is RAS converting enzyme 1 sitting within the membrane of the ER. Okay, so here is RCE1. And basically, once the uh, RAS protein is now anchored into uh, the ER membrane, so here it is, what's going to happen is the RCE1 enzyme is going to have access to this RAS protein, which I'll continue to draw in green here. And it's going to be able to chop off the final free amino acids of the RAS protein polypeptide. So it's going to chop off the final free amino acids. It's going to conduct this AAX proteolysis. Okay, now that's not the uh, only postprenylation modification. What happens after you have cleaved off uh, these final free amino acids? Well, the cysteine residue now becomes the final amino acid in the polypeptide. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that the cysteine residue, which is prenylated uh, and has this um, phanazyl group sticking off of it, is going to have a free carboxylic acid group. So let me draw it here. So here is this final cysteine now. So it has its amino group here. Then here's the alpha carbon. And of course, we have our um, R group, which consists of this methylene group. And now with this file group that has the farnazyl group stuck off it. So the cysteine has been farnazylated. So this is the farnazyl group here. OK, but now we have a free carboxylic acid group because we are now the final amino acid. So even though originally there was the AAX here and we were involved in a peptide bond to the next amino acid, now that we've cleaved that off, uh, we have a free carboxylic acid group. However, this is not going to last long, basically. What's going to happen is there is another enzyme which is going to basically forge an ester link here, okay? So it's going to convert this carboxylic acid group that is free now to a carboxylic acid group which has uh, an ester link to a methyl group, okay, like so. So you're going to stick on a methyl group like so onto this final free carboxylic acid group of the cysteine residue. Okay, and again, the enzyme that does this is sitting within the ER membrane. Okay, so here it is. And it's called uh, the ICMT enzyme. So it's called ICMT. 
okay? And this stands for isoprenal cysteine because uh, this Farnesyl group could also be called an isoprenal group, okay, because it's based on the structure of isoprene. So some people refer to it as a prenal group, some people will refer to it as an isoprenal group, okay, and the naming of this enzyme reflects uh, the naming of the Farnesyl group as an isoprenal group rather than a prenal group. Okay, so isoprenal cysteine refers to the cysteine that has an isoprenal group sticking off of it, and all the fat is just this I here, so it's not the I and the C. You might be tempted to think that the I is for isoprenal and the C is for, for cysteine, but it's not. The I is isoprenal cysteine. And then uh, the next bit is carboxymethyltransferase. Okay, so the C is for carboxy. Okay, the M is for methyl, and then the T is for transferase. Okay, so this name makes utter sense because we are transferring a methyl group onto the carboxy group uh, of the isoprenal cysteine. Okay, right, uh, so there is this enzyme in the ER membrane known as the isoprenal cysteine carboxymethyl transferase enzyme, which is going to add a methyl group onto the carboxylic acid group of this uh, cysteine that is now the terminal cysteine of the RAS protein. Okay, and this concludes the uh, post-prenylation modifications. In the next video, we'll turn our attention to how uh, the RAS proteins move from the endoplasmic reticulum membrane now that they have been uh, farnesylated and have their post-prenylation modifications done, how they're going to move uh, to other sites, other membrane sites within the cell, such as the plasma membrane. And this is going to involve further lipid modifications. Indeed, it's going to involve palmitylation in most cases.